is a Christian revolution. If you want a miracle, you've got to expect it to happen. You are the recipients of God's grace and God's blessings, and you rejoice in that reality. Welcome to Life Today Live, and you know, if you were just a great pastor or evangelist or some church leader, you could you could really influence the culture. You could change people around you. If only you had that title and that education, that background. <laughs> Thank God that's not true. If you look in the scripture and look in history, you'll find that God uses some very ordinary people to do some very extraordinary things. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. There is a book that is just out now. It's called Authentic Influencer. And uh, I like the use of the modern terminology there because this whole thing, we, we didn't, influencers when, when I was a kid was not a thing. But I get it. It is now, and it just means someone who is helping to shape your thoughts, to, to point you maybe in a direction, maybe to challenge you, to uh, open your mind to some things, um, and ultimately kind of change those people in your sphere, uh, whether it's online or you know in your office, in your school, in your family. You are to be that kind of influencer, and we have some proven principles. We have some great examples, one in particular that we'll talk about, to guide you to be a godly influencer. So I'm excited to have Jonathan Murphy as my guest today. Jonathan uh, is a teaching pastor here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area at uh, Christ Chapel Bible Church. If you're familiar with that or one of its campuses, you can also watch it online. And also he's the chair of the Department of Pastoral Ministries. I had to look at that one to get it right. Over at Dallas Theological Sem Seminary, a great institution and you know bedrock of the Dallas Fort Worth area. So we're excited to have him. Jonathan, welcome to Life Today Live. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Randy. Yeah. I guess we should probably explain the accent because you were born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, educated in, in Spain and uh and then also in Scotland and or grew up in Spain, educated in Scotland and the United States. So you you're all over the place. That's right. Yeah, I, I really am. So the accents from Northern Ireland which sounds very Scottish because many of us in Northern Ireland are, are sort of rooted in Scotland originally. But I grew up in Spain, the Canary Islands, actually, the islands that belong to Spain. Uh, my parents were missionaries there, so I grew up as a pastor's kid. And eventually they sent uh, myself and my older brother back to Northern Ireland to boarding school uh, to finish our education. And then I went on to Scotland to go to university and then over to Texas. So I, I've been around quite a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's good that you finally made it to the promised land. That's true. Okay. I, I tell people that I, I'm not Texan, but I got here as fast as I possibly could. Yeah. Yeah. We, we would have figured that part out on our own, but thank you for, <laughs> yeah. for letting us know. Let's jump into this because here's the interesting thing about the book, uh, about what you're, you're teaching us is it's, it's about Barnabas, which is one of those names that we kind of know from the Bible. But I bet when you get down to it that most people don't know really that much about him. Mm. Tell us a little bit about yeah. this guy. Yeah, so Barnabas only really pops up in the book of Acts six or seven times. So if you're trying to read through Acts or if you're trying to read through the Bible in a year, you'd read right past him mm -hmm. uh, and not stop to, to chew on, you know, what is emerging there as it relates to his life. So we kind of reduce him to what we know of him the first time we encounter him in Acts 4, which is a son of encouragement. You know, he's just referred to as an encourager. That's what Barnabas means. And so we go, oh, Barnabas, yeah, that's the encourager. But he's way more than that. And as you said a little bit earlier, he's, he's an ordinary guy like many of us, but he models for ordinary people, ordinary believers like you and I, how to be authentic influencers in the world for Jesus Christ. And so he's a remarkable individual if you just stop long enough to, to learn from him, which is what I set out to do in the book and to encourage other believers to do so also. So let's let's walk through some of these. You've got 15 key principles uh, from Barnabas uh, that we can apply today. Um, talk about some of those. Pick some of those that you think will move people in a positive direction. 
Yeah, so I guess the first one, which is the the bedrock of all of them, really is the principle of influence that 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 God has called every follower of the Lord Jesus Christ to exert godly influence in the world, beginning with whoever happens to be around you. And that really is drawn from what Jesus declares in the Sermon on the Mount, that you are the salt uh, and the light of the world, that his followers are to be as salty as believers, as salt is right to our food. We can flavor society and that we're to be as light in a dark world as, as light in a dark room is. So that said, uh, which is the call for every believer, then I build the other 14 principles from the life of Barnabas off of that one. Okay. And so he shows us, I say, rather than he tells us what it means to be influence in society where you're at just as jesus christ has called us to be most believers want to represent the lord jesus christ well but for many reasons we are either distracted or discouraged or we kind of farm out that responsibility to to professional clergy and pastors or ministry leaders uh, and while we want to influence those around us we often don't know how. I mean, unless I preach a sermon mm -hmm. or write a book or have some some position or important title, I, I can't influence, right? Well, Barnabas says that's not true. <laughs> uh, Barnabas has no title, never wrote a book. We don't have a sermon he ever wrote. Uh, but we do have his story in the scriptures and the activities he participated in and ultimately, he left us incredible people like the Apostle Paul and like John Mark. So one of the principles I, I draw out closer to the end of the book uh, concerns legacy. Mm. That, that legacy is not what you leave, but who you leave mm. behind. Mm. And Barnabas essentially uh, pops in and out of the scriptures and then eventually sails off. Uh, the pages of known history, and and we don't hear from him again. But what he left us was two individuals, two people, the Apostle Paul, who goes on to become, you know, perhaps the greatest Christian thinker ever outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, who wrote, and he wrote most of the New Testament. Right, right. And he also leaves us John Mark, who who really becomes the author of one of the Gospels. And then many would say that his Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, influenced the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. And of course, Luke wrote Luke and Acts. So my point in that principle of legacy is that we shift our mindset to think of a legacy being determined by who we leave behind, not, not our names on buildings. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Not our, right. not our you know, not getting on to rich lists uh, yeah. and, and, and I don't know, becoming some sort of entry in Wikipedia, right, for people to read about, but, but ultimately to, to look out to those around us and invest ourselves in just helping launch them in light of God's vision for their lives. That's ultimately a legacy of eternal value. Yeah, though that's a, that's a good uh, paradigm shift. Uh, the idea yeah. of legacy being the people, not necessarily the wealth or the buildings, the notoriety or things like that, because we can all do that. We all have people yeah. in our lives and we can all, you know, uh, have an influential role in shaping them in the direction of their life. It's interesting that you point that out because with, with Paul, because uh, everybody knows the Apostle Paul, right? We know the, the book of Mark or whatever. I have seen time after time again that the the famous person has someone behind yeah. them that you know people don't know until you get sort of the old Paul Harvey now you know the rest of the story kind of thing I, I it seems that God uses pe people obviously in different ways but he has some that his purpose is to you know you are to be a major influence on maybe just one person, maybe just a child, yep. or maybe just a handful of people. And then others, he seems to have, you know, you know you're going to be known, you're going to influence thousands. You know, my dad has preached to probably 
<laughs> by this time, you know, millions of people because he sort of that Bill, old Billy Graham model, yeah. except that he would do it three, four, five times a night in one week. Um, there's something to the the hidden influencer though that I think we a lot of people need to hear because we kind of get it when you know suddenly your book shoots to number one and you're, you're getting all the interview requests and all that kind of thing but we seem to downplay the hidden role and what i kind of hear you saying is that no the hidden role is just as valuable in god's kingdom as the loud you know notoriety yeah that's right that, that's ex- i mean you're hitting the nail on the head that that ultimately people shape people that god's major instrument to shape others' lives is your life and my life. Mm -hmm. And most of us, historically speaking, not even just alive today, but historically speaking, are not called to be an Apostle Paul or a Moses, you know, or or a John the Baptist. Most of us have been called to just reach those around us. Whoever, Whoever happens to be nearby in wherever our spheres of life take place, they're your responsibility and my responsibility before God. And and so we have wonderful opportunities to be able to shape them for Jesus in ways perhaps that some of the more well-known, grander, ministried individuals can't reach. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's a that's a wonderful thought that God doesn't look at his bride, the church, and say, well, he's more important than than her because he has this role. He looks at us all and says, I have decided all of your roles. The question is, are you going to step into that? Mm -hmm. And are you going to reach those around you? And that's all you're going to be held accountable for when you stand before the Lord, right? When you stand before the Lord one day, you're going to be responsible for his assignment on your life which includes those around you. And your pastor is not going to be there beside you and, and neither is, you know, whoever else, whoever else, you know, influence your life. They're, they're not going to be there. You're going to stand alone. And so it's important that we, we do that paradigm shift that we say, I have a role to play in the building of God's kingdom through people in a very specific way. And it's a very important role in the eyes of God. And God puts lots of people in the scriptures who actually stepped into that sort of anonymous, uh, hidden right. uh, ministry for Christ. And one of the things I love about Barnabas is that Barnabas is very comfortable with anonymity. And he's very comfortable, you know, in obscurity, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he, he just goes about reaching whoever happens to cross his life you know and yeah. Yeah. and i find that encouraging yeah no doubt and about it so you, you should go ahead. i'm sorry i, I spoke all believers it. should all be, believers you know, should, should be well this, that's that's kind of where i was going but you, do you ever hear this well, i use this term vocational ministry to describe what you and i do meaning it's it's our job and it's a ministry related job right do you ever hear people say uh i wish i was in full-time ministry like you and you just yeah. would go, you are. <laughs> that's right. You are. Yeah, and that, you, you're right. And that's what I, one of the areas I'm trying to draw out in the early chapters is that if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're a follower for Jesus Christ. And so every little sphere of life that you participate in is sacred space. You, you're, you're encountering people that become your responsibilities. So some of the illustrations and the stories that I use are right across the map. You've got a you've got a man in Scotland who who wanted to be in what you refer to as vocational ministry and, and was unable to. So he decided to just teach the, the local kids the Bible and he, he couldn't get space to do it in. So when the tide was out, there was the sea cave that he <laughs> took them into with a few lights and he just taught them the Bible there. And his impact on that village was for decades. You know, it was fantastic. Or, or I tell a story of a, of a stay-at-home mom who 
who never really departed that far from where she was born and grew up. Uh, and her, her, her life essentially was tidying up the household and, and rearing children and then making sure they didn't kill each other and, you know, wiping their little sniffly noses. But she saw that as sacred space, as, as, as a, a cathedral in which she could serve God and worship God. So I agree. I, I think believers have a responsibility to see everywhere they go as a ministry opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we refer to vocational and bivocational language, really just to help clarify what type of role we're in, you know, nine to five-ish. Right. But, but really, those are artificial categories. Uh, we're all called to serve the Lord, you know, in, in whatever sphere of life he's, he's taken us to. Absolutely. And that's what I think people need to hear uh, and be encouraged. Uh, you, you are uh, designed to be, as the book title says, an authentic influencer for God. And we are all his agents of change. Jonathan will encourage you. And so if you want to pick up the book, by the way, you can pick up that book. It's available now wherever you get books just out. Uh, and we'll look at Barnabas. So you you got to know this. If not, I'm putting you on the spot. What was Barnabas, his his original name as a Levite from Cyprus? Yeah, so his name wasn't even Barnabas, right? His right. name was Joseph. And, and it's incredible, you know, nobody knows him as Joseph. What, right. And Barnabas, is, Barnabas is a nickname. It is a nickname, but it's also a God-called name. And that's what I like yeah. about it, because it says you're born one way, you're given a name by your parents, but when you follow God's call to be his agent of change, he He enables you with his gifts. So you get Barnabas the encourager, right? Yeah, that's it, right. There's a, to me, there's, there's a spiritual uh, aspect to that, an anointing, if you will, uh, called out by God in his surrender and his humility to be used however. I, I find that encouraging. Do you get into that at all? Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, well, just you mentioned that. Let me say this. You know, the, the, the book of Acts, which is where Barnabas' story comes to us through, you know, we call it the Acts of the Apostles, but, of course, more accurately, it would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. through the Apostles. Mm -hmm. And Barnabas... Uh, Joseph, which is a great name if you're if you have a Jewish heritage, right? I mean, mom and dad called him Joseph because they had great aspirations for his life as a Jewish man, as a Levite. But but the believers around him very quickly realize that while Joseph is a good name of good Jewish stock, this guy does something to us that is beautiful he encourages us he comforts us and so it's interesting that in the book of acts of the holy spirit through the apostles that barnabas is the one who's nicknamed son of encouragement or son of comfort which in the in the greek is son of paraclesis which is the very nickname oh, wow. for the holy spirit that, that jesus gives the Holy Spirit yeah, yeah. in the Gospel of John. I'm oh, going to wow. send you an encourager. I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you the paraclete. And so Barnabas from the get-go is introduced to someone in the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit who embodied wow. the type of ministry of the Spirit to those who he happened to encounter, both in his local church and then throughout the missionary journey that he participates in, just at every turn. So he is very clearly connected as being a man who served in keeping with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. And wow, what a, what a change. I mean, can you imagine if, if we shifted in our mindset from being, yeah, I'm, I'm Randy Robinson or I'm Jonathan Murphy, Murphy to I'm child of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. I mean, that's that's a lot of weight, uh, and that's a lot of power and a lot of responsibility. I mean, yeah. if if we look at this from all sides, I, I would say, Jonathan, that it's not just an, an honor, and it is the greatest honor, 
to be a child of the Holy Spirit, to be an influencer for Christ, it, it is also um, a level of responsibility, is it not? Absolutely. You know, across the scriptures, you know, God has made it very, very clear that he chooses to use us in what he's doing in the world. And, and, and he could do it better without you and, and, and me, <laughs> but, but he has involved us in his purposes in history for many reasons, one of them including fellowship and, and the ability to walk with God and, and to walk with God. And that's beautiful, but, but in doing that, we, we display, we advertise, we show the world what it looks like to be a child of God. Mm -hmm. And so that's a massive responsibility. Do you make God look good through your life? Yeah. Would would anybody around you, instead of saying he's a son of so and so, would say he's a son and a daughter of God? He's a son and daughter of the Holy Spirit. That that's that's what we see being channeled through his or her life. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's a massive responsibility. But it's a responsibility that we can do when we walk with the Spirit. We're not alone. We have the capacity to represent Him well. Oh, yeah. Yes. And that's a good point uh, because it's it's a responsibility that if we accept, He enables us to be able to fulfill it. That's correct. Right. Yeah. And so there's not a lot of, that burden is light. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, uh, do you know, is there any extra biblical resources, Josephus or anything uh, talking about Barnabas, do we know more than what Acts says? Yeah, not 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 that I have found that would be reliable. You yeah. know, in the first century, yeah. uh, you, you do have uh, a much later work called the Gospel of Barnabas. You know, it's oh. it's a it's an alternate gospel, but that you know that's that's late. So you know what what people ended up doing was let me figure out who was an influential guy. Let me write a book and say it was his. Right. Uh, and then suddenly it's a seller, you know, and it spreads so that somebody later on kind of invoked his name to use it. But but no, I, I mean, this is what's so beautiful. Barnabas pretty much sails off the pages of known history in Acts 15. Wow. And we never hear of him again. But we do have what he left or who he left, yeah. John and the Apostle Paul. In fact, in Acts 15, when he sails off, to Cyprus, he does so parting company with Paul, which is another issue I try and bring out, that, that, that Barnabas saw potential in people when everybody else just saw problems mm. in people. And so when John Mark, who has let Paul and Barnabas down, wants to join the next missionary journey, Paul says, no way, he can't come with us. He failed us in the past. And Barnabas says, oh, no way, he's coming with me. He puts his arm around this guy because he sees potential in him, even mm. though he has failed them in the past. Mm. But that's exactly what Barnabas did for Paul in Acts 9. <laughs> in Acts 9, the church doesn't want to meet Paul. Right? Paul's this guy who claims to be a Christian, but he was heading up to Damascus to kill Christians. Yeah. And so when, when he heads up, when he heads up to Jerusalem, and he knocks on the door of the disciples uh, to say, hey, I want to join you. They kind of go, no way. <laughs> There's no way this is happening. Uh, and then it says, but Barnabas met with Paul and he listened to his story and he saw essentially what God had done in his life. And because of Barnabas, Paul joins the church hmm. and then ministers freely in Jerusalem as a representative of the church. So Barnabas did for John Mark what Barnabas had done for Paul years earlier, uh, and then just sails off the known pages of history, and we never hear of him again. He's quite happy, as I said earlier, with anonymity and obscurity. His goal is to make sure that if God puts somebody in his way, that he launches that person God's way. Wow. Uh, that's actually that's beautiful in a lot of ways uh, and, yeah. and, and powerful in knowing that we can all do that if we'll just pay attention to who's right in front of us. Even the losers that the famous people reject because they've failed before to go, yeah. mm, no, I'll tell you what, I, you, you got to imagine Barnabas was kind of laughing at Paul. Like, dude, do you not see yourself in, in John Mark? 
Yeah, look, yeah. come come with me, and I will I will disciple you in the Holy Spirit. This idea of discipleship, um, we have a lot of hit and run uh, ministry in the United States. You know, come in, yeah. do this, change your life. I'm out of here. There's yeah. something discipleship that says, no, I will sit with you through the day to day and grow step by step. I'm growing some shrubs and I have been for almost a year now. It is a slow process just to grow a shrub, much less a person. Yeah. How yeah. important is it that we, if, you know, called into it, because I do believe some are called as evangelists, which is a little more hit and run approach, you know, um, yeah. or as maybe a filmmaker who makes a film that changes your life sitting in the seat, but we never meet. Those who are called to discipleship in, in a very organic way, uh, I think there's something very special to that, which is often not seen and often not, you know, you don't get books written about you all the time, yeah. but it's very important. Absolutely. I mean, the Great Commission goes out to all believers to, to go and make disciples. Mm -hmm. Now, all the there's going to be a, a variety of ways in which that occurs, but all believers have a responsibility to grow or or form the heart of whoever happens to be nearby. And Barnabas did that, I believe, through what I call in the book, meaningful presence. He was present with people. Mm. And, and not just being there, but being there and being alert and being attentive and, 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 and knowing who the individual was and what their past was and how to help them move on with God. And so, you know, Barnabas in Acts 11 is picked by the church to go and become essentially the lead pastor of this new church in Antioch, which becomes the first international missionary sending church mm. in, in the Christian era. And Barnabas gets picked to be the senior pastor essentially. But when Barnabas goes there and he encourages them and he begins to teach, he says, you know, I need help here. And you know who I need? I need Paul. Hmm. Now, we haven't heard from Paul since Acts 9. He's, he went home to Tarsus. And Barnabas goes and gets him. And he brings him to Antioch. And with Barnabas, Paul teaches there for a year. So essentially, Barnabas mentors and develops and disciples Paul personally, mm. meaningful presence. Mm -hmm. and then in Acts 13 and 14, the first missionary journey, he says, come on, let's go. You and I are going together. This Holy Spirit's leading us out to spread the gospel across, you know, the, the Mediterranean area there in modern day Turkey. But, but he does it with Paul together, meaningful presence. They talk along the way. They talk at night as they're, I don't know, looking up at the stars in the middle of some sort of countryside outside of a village. They, they did life together, and there's nothing more influential in another person's life than your meaningful presence, yeah. than your words, than your, than your availability, than your you know, investment in them. And that is at the heart of, uh, at the heart of discipleship. And again, like we said earlier, Everybody can do that, and everybody must do that. Because, Randy, you and I are limited in the amount of relationships that we can have that are meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I can preach a sermon, and I can teach a lecture, and I can write a book, but I don't have those relationships that you have. Right. I can't be meaningfully present in their lives. And that's the gold as it relates to true discipleship. Mm. I'm providing some information from the word of God, but you're actually digesting that with someone yeah. and helping them customize it to their, to their lives. Mm. And so if every believer caught that vision, I really do think we could turn any society around uh, because ultimately society has been influenced for the worse. And yet the church has the ability to influence it for the better. Yeah. Well, I and like that so, phrase. Uh, I like yeah. that, that meaningful presence. Uh, very good. All right. This is something I think that takes uh, purpose. It, it takes, in other words, you, you need to be purposeful about doing this to learn to become 
aware uh, to learn what that meaningful presence means and looks like and to figure out yeah. who is that around me that God's placed in my life. I mean, it's, it's your neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? Literally, it's your near one. Who has God put there? Who's near you? Well, that's yeah. your mission field. Uh, and so you can start to do it. Uh, I want to show you Jonathan's website. This is sjonathanmurphy.com. Uh, what does the S stand for? You have to tell us when you use an initial in your website. Yeah, Samuel. My first name is Samuel. I go by Jonathan, but it's Samuel Jonathan Murphy. And so the S is, is sort of a family name. My uncle was Samuel. My grandfather was Samuel. Uh, that's a good Irish thing. But on, on my mom's side, it's a bit of a family name. Yeah, the, the Irish, are they I literally have patterns in which your children must be named. I, I learned that a while back. And it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm adopted, so my name is not Aloysius, or would have been. So, um, good, John. Is there anything I missed? I uh, appreciate your time. I love the insight. love the discussion, the encouragement. Anything you want to tell well, people, let people know about before I let you go? The book is available. I believe the book is going to help you know how to be able to be that natural influencer. So you don't need to invent ways to do it. Barnabas has put in the scripture so that you just copy what he did. And if you copy what he did... Hopefully, we'll be able to birth great men and women of God in the next generation. I love it. Uh, great news. You are reborn to be an authentic influencer. If you need a little guidance through the life of Barnabas in the book by Jonathan Murphy, you can do that. Check it out. Hit like, share, hit follow, and uh, come back. We've got more encouragement for you. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live.